Welcome to the Candidate Forum for the Illinois House of Representatives 18th District. This event is being recorded. I'm Judy Hoffman of the League of Women Voters of Evanston. This forum is co-sponsored by the Leagues of Women Voters of Evanston, Wilmette, Winnetka Northfield Kenilworth, and we're working in partnership with the Wilmette Public Library. The forum will be posted in its entirety on the Wilmette Public Library YouTube channel and the participating league websites. The candidates are also welcome to post the forum in its entirety on their campaign websites. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. We do not support or oppose any candidate or political party. Our mission is to encourage informed and active participation in government, increase understanding of major public policy issues, provide information and support voters during all election cycles. The League is hosting this forum because we believe that while voting itself is important, an informed vote is ideal. I'd like to thank the candidates for their participation. We appreciate your willingness to share your thoughts and positions with the constituents of the 18th district so that they may make an informed choice when they cast their ballots in the election. Before we begin, I'd like to point out some important upcoming dates for this election. Online voter registration is open through October 23rd. Mail-in ballots are now being sent out and you can still request one now through November 3rd, but don't delay. Uh, October 24th is the first day of early voting and November 7th is the last day of early voting and for dropping off your vote by mail ballots at secure lock boxes. And of course, Tuesday, November 8th, election day. I also wanna make you aware of a powerful tool provided by the League of Women Voters of Illinois the Illinois Voter Guide. It's a nonpartisan portal for all election information, including access to your sample ballot, which I know a lot of people are looking for now. The guide can be found at IllinoisVoterGuide.org. Again, IllinoisVoterGuide.org. Uh, audience, the closed captioning has been enabled but if you are unable to see it, please check your settings to turn it on. For all league forums, we engage a trained moderator that resides outside of the district of the race. And we are honored to have today Barb Lyman's as our moderator. Barb is a former government teacher and civics mentor liaison for the McCormick Foundation. She is past co-president of the Wheaton League of Women Voters and currently serves as coordinator of the Civic Awareness Series and Voter Service for the Wheaton League. Barb, I hand the virtual mic to you. Thank you so much, Judy. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor for me to be moderating today's candidate forum for Illinois House of Representative District 18. Before we begin the forum, I would like to begin by reviewing some of the league ground rules for candidate forums. The candidates attending today have signed and returned the ground rules by the deadline established in the invitation. These rules specify the format, time limits, and other rules related to the conduct of the forum. I will be responsible for enforcing these rules. The candidates will begin in alphabetical order with their opening statements. They will then alternate in order as they answer each question. And after the question portion of the forum, each candidate will be given giving a closing statement. Each candidate will be given one and a half minutes for their opening statement, one and a half minutes to, to respond to each question, and one and a half minutes to make a closing statement. Their responses will be timed as you will see on the screen. The timer will give all candidates a 30 second warning. The questions have been submitted by the public and league members in advance of today's forum and have been screened for appropriateness for the office and to avoid duplication. Regrettably, there will not be enough time for today's to ask all the questions that have been submitted. The format today is a candidate forum, not a debate forum. Candidates are expected to accurately represent the facts. The League of Women Voters is not responsible for the accuracy of statements made by the candidates. 
It is the responsibility of the public, news media, opposing candidates to fact check statements made by the candidates as they deem necessary. This forum is held as a public service to the voters so they can hear directly from the candidates regarding their qualifications for Illinois House of Representatives. Candidates' responses reflect their own views and opinions, and they will refrain from commenting on the views of other candidates. Finally, I do want to emphasize how grateful we are for the candidates who are not only willing to serve in office, but who agreed to participate this afternoon. So let's welcome the candidates for Illinois House District 18, candidate Robin Gable and candidate Charles Hutchinson. Welcome. Thank you both for joining us. So let's begin with opening statements. Candidate Gable, you have one and a half minutes for your opening statement. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event. It's a great opportunity to be able to share uh, what I've done and what I will do um, in the state legislature. I would like to give you a little background in case you don't know me. I grew up in Skokie during the 60s and uh, was influenced by the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, and the anti-war movements. It really inspired me to spend my life fighting for justice. And today, I feel that even more strongly. Due to the attacks on voting rights, on reproductive rights, and the destruction of our natural, national, um, of our natural environment, um, I uh, really am, am looking forward to continuing this fight for justice here. I wanna read the preamble, uh, a part of the preamble of the Illinois Constitution, just to let you know what, our, what the goals of our Constitution is and what our requirements are as legislators. It says, to provide for the health, safety, and welfare of the people, maintain a representative and orderly government, eliminate poverty and inequality, assure legal, social, and economic justice, provide opportunity for the fullest development of the individual, um, and ensure domestic tranquility. Um, these are things that are dear to my heart, and it has been an honor to serve up to this point. So thank you. I look forward to the discussion and uh, our comments about the various issues that we're going to talk about. Thank you. Candidate Hutchinson, you have one and a half minutes for your opening statement. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters, as well as the Women Public Library, and to everybody for joining us. My name is Charles Hutchinson. I am a candidate for the 18th District of the Illinois House. And I come to you not just as a candidate, but as a husband and a father and as a small business owner. I've lived most of my life in the state of Illinois, and I've been in the North Shore for over a decade. I am the president of our local chamber of commerce. I'm also the chairman of our historic preservation commission, and I sit on the board of our nonprofit theater. Now, the reason uh, the reason why I'm running it was not an easy thought. It took a lot of lot of contemplation, but what I saw during the pandemic really made me want to run and represent the people of the 18th, because what I saw during the pandemic was that we, as our legislators, did not stand up for families, did not stand up for parents when their kids were locked out of school. They did not stand up for businesses when they were deemed not essential. And they didn't stand up for families, but we were told that we couldn't get together or even go to church. So I'm going to go to Springfield to represent the people of the 18th and to bring some common sense. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Candidate Hutchinson, we'll begin with you for the first question. What do you feel are the top two challenges Illinois faces today? The top two challenges Illinois faces today right now are crime and also inflation. We need to definitely work on getting guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them and criminals. And we need to use our police effectively in order to get crime out of our streets. People want to live in safe neighborhoods. People deserve to live in safe neighborhoods and the state should be providing safe neighborhoods. We need to use the resources, give resources to the police in order to help make neighborhoods safe for people, for families, so kids can go to school unaccosted and be able to free, be able to be free to learn. Also, inflation is a huge issue as well. We've had a lot of tax increases. We are one of the highest states for gas tax, for property taxes, and for overall taxes. And when we do that with inflation, it just makes it worse for everybody. It makes it very difficult 
for working families to make ends meet. And people are really struggling to whether or not they're gonna be paying the rent, paying their mortgage, putting food on the table, and how they're gonna be, you know, basically getting their kids um, into schools and activities. So the two biggest issues we have, crime and inflation, monetary issues. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Gable, what do you feel are the top two challenges Illinois faces today? So I think the two top challenges that we have in Illinois today would be uh, gun violence prevention. And I'll start with that. Um, I think that uh, that it that Illinois already is one of the best states in terms of um, our, our laws to protect people from guns. We definitely have some really good gun safety laws, but I think more needs to be done. I think that we need to increase uh, the threshold for background checks to ensure that people with history of violence against others or themselves are not allowed to own guns. Um, and I think we need to, to by, by uh, closing these loopholes, I think that we will really try to get some of the guns off the street. Um, part of the way, reason that, way that we do that is requiring firearm dealers to have to check and make sure that people's FOID cards wasn't revoked. Right now, we don't do that. Um, I think we also need to help prevent uh, gun violence is the banning of magazines with more than 10 or 15 rounds. Nobody needs those kinds of weapons. And also banning semi-automatic assault weapons. Um, those are some of the things I think we need to do. This last year, we were able to have a new program of uh, gun safety education. And uh, we're going to be doing more work on letting families know how to uh, lock up their guns in their homes. Thank you. Candidate, so the, I, I'm sorry, your time is up. Um, candidate Gable, I'm going to begin the next question with you. I didn't get to talk about the other issue. <laughs> candidate Gable, this is a two-part question. What do you think are one or two of our greatest environmental challenges? And the second part of the question is, and do you have a preferred policy to address these concerns? So once again, what do you think are one or two of the greatest environmental challenges? And do you have a preferred policy to address these concerns? So and I'm glad, sure, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, to me, our, the most serious environmental issue now is climate change. And I am proud to say that I was on the negotiating team that worked to pass a CJA. Many of you may have heard of it. It's the uh, Climate Equitable Jobs Act. And this is a bill that will address many of our issues in the state regarding uh, energy and power. It will increase the, um, the uh, renewable energy that we have. But the most important thing is that we really set a deadline for having, uh, 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 we're gonna have clean energy by 2040 and all renewable energy by 2050. It's also a very equitable, Act that we passed. So we really uh, paid attention to areas that uh, have uh, of economic, of uh, environmental injustices that have passed. And we also really put in ways to re educate some of the uh, workers who will be losing their jobs as, as um, fossil fuel jobs go away. So I, I think that this is one of the biggest items, but I also think we really need to look at other aspects of our environment. I recently passed a bill for a young girl from uh, Winnetka who was concerned that by spraying for mosquitoes, we are uh, also killing bees and butterflies. And uh, we passed a bill to uh, help, help uh, to keep bees and butterflies in this uh, world. Thank you. Candidate Hutchinson, what do you think are one or two of our greatest environmental challenges? And do you have a preferred policy to address these concerns? Well, thank you for the question. I would say the number one, the two biggest issues we have in our environment here in Illinois, number one is lead pipes carrying on water supply. We know what lead does to developing children and even children in utero when it comes to their ability to develop fully mentally and physically. The fact that we have a, I think it's a 30 year plan to get rid of lead pipes um, is a disgrace. It should be a two to three year plan. We know where the lead pipes are. We need to start digging and get rid of them. 
It's not going to help anybody to keep the lead pipes there for 30 to 40 years. We need to work vigorously on getting rid of the lead pipes. Number two is the forever chemicals we're finding in our water. We need to find a way to get rid of these chemicals. Clearly, our water, you know, filtration plants aren't doing the job. That's just because it's a new, new thing. So we need to work with our industry, with our industry leaders, as well as our universities. We have some great universities and great scientists and great minds that can work on to get rid of these forever chemicals because they're just going to cause more problems for people health down the down the down the road. So yes, lead pipes and forever chemicals. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Hutchinson, the next question will begin with you. What measures do you support to safeguard the availability of clean water for drinking, agriculture, and other needs? Great question. Again, I think what we need to do, as I've just said, um, part of that is getting rid of the lead pipes that we have in our systems. We have the most lead pipes of anywhere in the world. So in order to keep those, to keep our water clean, you know, we got to stop the leaching of the lead into the water. Also, the forever, forever chemicals are a problem. I mean, it's something that was new. We didn't quite know about it until recently, but we need to be working with industry leaders. We need to be working with um, our universities and our, our great minds that we have here in this state on how to clean up our water and keep them clean. Um, those are the two biggest uh, issues that we have and the ways to uh, maintain uh, clean water for agriculture and for, for um for drinking purposes. I know that we've done a, a massive amount of work in the last two decades on no-till farming, which has been great for topsoil, even though we still do lose a lot of it. But uh, we keep that, take that same innovation and apply it to our water sources and we'll keep clean water in Illinois for a very long time. Thank you. Candidate Gable, what measures do you support to safeguard the availability of clean water for drinking? agriculture and other needs? Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so I agree that lead in the water is a, um, uh, is, is a critical issue. Um, although it's more important lead in paint and housing is, is where most of the children are, are being poisoned by lead. But nobody wants lead in our water. I've been working as the uh, chair of the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus to, uh, on this issue. In Illinois, we passed a couple of bills. The latest one does have a plan to address uh, the lead lead pipes. You know, it's unfortunate that Chicago has one of the most number of lead pipes than anywhere in the country. Um, it's also extremely costly to remove these pipes. So uh, we are looking at the federal government for to get some help in removing these pipes and and uh, uh, exchanging them. Um, I think that that's where some of the funding is going to have to come from. I've heard complaints from local governments saying that they just can't afford to do this. It's so costly, but I think we will be able to do that. The, uh, the issue of uh, PFAS and water is something that I've already had a bill on. We did, uh, we, we checked all the drinking water throughout the, throughout the state, and there were only a few areas where the PFAS were high. One of them, one of the areas is exactly this district. It's Evanston, Wilmette, and Winnetka. And uh, we have a new bill that we're working on and we're working with um, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District to, uh, to figure out a way and to identify where that PFABs are coming from. Thank you. Kennedy Gable, the next question will begin with you. Do you support Illinois' $350 million commitment to the evidence-based funding for public schools? Would you support a greater increase in order to reach the adequacy target on time? Uh, yes, I do. I do uh, support this $350 million additional dollars. We put it in for the last four years at least. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's necessary to create some equity and justice in our education program. A system that's dependent solely on property taxes is uh, very unequal throughout the state. What this $350 million does is it, uh, it is distributed in a way that um, it really helps uh, districts that have less money for each student. In our district, our schools are actually very good and they don't receive quite as much of this money um, but uh, I do support the funding for, uh, for um, the 350 million additional funds for the evidence-based uh, funding for schools. Um, 
I think that uh, this year, we actually in our budget did more for education. We uh, increased our funding for the monetary award program, uh, as well as other educational funding increases. We also have 122 million increase in uh, the monetary award program is the 122 million, but we also have 2.3 million increase for minority teacher scholarships. We have a 5% increase for universities and community colleges. So we really are working hard to make sure that Illinois uh, is producing the most educated students. Thank you. Linda Hutchinson, the same question. Thank you for the question. I do support more funding for schools and I think we need to do it the right way. Um, recently, the Wall Street Journal came out and gave Illinois an F. 37% of the kids statewide read and do math at grade level. And that's a shame. In fact, that's disgusting. We should not have that. Uh, we need to do more to put money into the classrooms, less into the bureaucracy of the schools. You know, I know teachers, I know teachers that pay out of their own pocket for school supplies, and that's wrong. We're hiring more bureaucracy and more administrators at six figure salaries, and teachers need to be getting that money. Classrooms need to be getting that money. You know, parents, you know, education is how we give kids opportunity. That's the one thing we give them for our, for kids that we don't know, we give them education. And that's in our constitution that we will provide it. Without education, there is no opportunity. And when 37% of the kids read at grade level and do math at grade level, we're not giving the opportunity we're supposed to be giving the kids. So yes, I support the $350 million. And I think we need to spend it wisely. We also need to do our budgets better where we're putting money in classrooms and not administration. And if parents can't get their kids educated in the schools that they're in, they should be able to move those kids. Your income should not be a barrier to getting your kids educated. That's that's wrong. You know, if you're going to give them, you know, either grants or vouchers, we should do that because we can't leave another generation of kids behind as we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Hutchinson, this next question will begin with you. How do you feel about school choice? And in addition to that question, do you support tax breaks for tuition at private and religious K-12 schools? So how do you feel about school choice? Do you support tax breaks for tuition at private and religious K-12 schools? Thank you for the question. I'll take the second part first. The Supreme Court has ruled that you can do tax breaks and I do support those. And the reason is I support school choice. And why do I support school choice? Because parents have a right to get their kids educated. As I just said, this, the, the Wall Street Journal has come out with a F for the Illinois state education system. We are 37% of our kids read at grade level. There are some communities where less than 2% of minority children read at grade level, and that's wrong. Those parents need to be able to send their kid to a school that will work for them and educate them. There's no excuse. I support public schools. My kids are in public schools, okay? But still, if your public school isn't educating your kids, we're very lucky to be up here in New Trier and Evanston Townships where we have good schools. Not everybody has that. So yes, if your, if your school is not educating your kids, you need to, parents need to be able to send their kids to a school that will educate them. And yes, tax breaks, I support those. I support vouchers. I support grants. I support all of the above to get kids educated because as I've said, that's our giving them opportunity to succeed. Thank you for the question. Candidate Google, the same question to you for a minute and a half. Could you repeat the question? Sure. How do you feel about school choice? Do you support tax breaks for tuition at private and religious K-12 schools? So I, I am a strong supporter of public schools and public education. I feel like, like that is the one equalizer for everyone in every economic bracket. Um, we have excellent schools up here, and it shows that public schools can work. And I would I would uh, work very hard to make sure that schools all across the state have the same kind of education that we have here. Public schools are a melting pot. They bring everyone together from all different cultural, um, religious aspects, and it's good for people to know people from all the different cultures. That's a strength. I think that in the past, some of these school choices have really been used to hollow out the public school funding. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't support that. I did support and I did vote uh, in favor of a, um, of a tax break that we had for individuals who gave 
uh, money to private schools. Um, but uh, that was the extent of it. It was a it was a small amount of money that the private uh, individuals who donated uh, would get a tax break for. Thank you. The next question, Kennedy Kibo, will begin with you. The Illinois Supreme Court has declared pension reforms unconstitutional. Would you support amending the Constitution to address pension spending? Or are there any other alternatives you would support to address it? So pension reform is something that has been on my agenda since I started in this job. Um, I, I just want to be clear that uh, as of January 1st, 2011, uh, we, there's a new, a new pension program for the state of Illinois that all new hirees are in a less generous pension program. So to me, our pension uh, uh, problem is time limited, um, although it is, it is serious. And this year we actually put an additional, I think it was 500 million into to pay for our pension payments um, that will save us over a billion dollars in the future. Um, I think that, uh, uh, as you know, the, the uh, court said that we could not change the current uh, pension plans that people are in, it was unconstitutional. I actually did vote for that bill to, um, because I felt like it was just changing the COLA and it would provide an opportunity for us to uh, pay off our pensions earlier and pay off our pensions better. Um, but as you know, it was struck down. Uh, I, I do, uh, I, I uh, think that um, our, our pensions um, is, is an issue that we have addressed by this tier two, and it will, it's, it's a, a time limited issue. Even if we change the constitution, it will not affect our pension debt. That will have no effect whatsoever on our pension debt. Candidate, Candidate Hutchinson, your thoughts. Thanks, it's a great question. Pension is a huge issue in Illinois. Um, yes, I do support amending the constitution. If we could do that, that would be uh, one of the keys. I mean, in, since 2010 to 2020, we've had 17 credit downgrades in the state of Illinois. A lot of that had to do with our pension debt. Um, we have had we have over 370, I believe, billion dollars that we still owe that we are behind on. The uh, 500 million that uh, we just heard about was part of from the federal government. That was part of a grant from the federal government to do that. Um, they had given us $8 billion to the uh, to the General Assembly for our budget issues, and $500 million of that went to the pensions, which is great, um, but we can't depend on that money. Um, what we need to do, as we see, we have pensions are now going smaller and smaller and smaller. If people who have pensions are going to keep them, we need to reform our pension system, period. Um, we need to be able to stop it, cut it off, have all new people that are coming in being on something different, a contribution-based plan, perhaps. And we're going to then take that not unfunded liability and turn it into debt, which we can manage. And that will help our credit rating. It will help people who have pensions to keep their pensions. Thank you for the question. Candidate Hutchinson, the next question. Do you see the Fair Tax Act being reintroduced in the next two years? Would you support that or not and why? Thanks for the question. Fair tax. Tax is huge in Illinois. We are the number one tax state uh, when it comes to overall tax. Uh, highest property taxes, highest gas taxes, highest overall taxes. Uh, so fair tax, that's uh, one of those misnomers that they like to put out there. It's not fair at all. Uh, right now we have a flat tax. Uh, makes it tougher for them to raise taxes because uh, they're not going to be able to pit one person against another group. Uh, or businesses against people. Um, so no, I don't support the fair tax because it is not fair. Right now we need to work on better spending of our money. Right now the legislature sees us as a bottomless piggy bank and that's not fair. Uh, we need to work on zero baseline budgeting. We haven't had a balanced budget since 2001. Every budget we passed has either been balanced through a grant from the federal government, which just happened this past one, or through borrowing and that's killing us. So. No, we're going to keep the flat tax as far as I'm concerned. It's the best way to do it. We're not going to go with a graduated tax. And we're going to work on lowering the tax burden for people so it's a better state to live in. Thanks. Thank you. Candidate Gable, your thoughts? Uh, the, could you repeat the question again? 
Do you see the Fair Tax Act being reintroduced during the next two years? Would you support that or not, and why? Well, I do not see the fair tax being introduced in the next uh, two years. So I don't think I, uh, uh, that's, <laughs> I just don't see it happening. So, um, I mean, I, I feel like uh, with, in the last two, in the last four years, we've had, we've had six um, bond upgrades. We've been doing tremendously better in our fiscal health. Uh, we have been, um, our, our revenue has been much better than we had thought during COVID, just our regular revenue. Uh, it's been pretty astounding. The dollars that we got from the federal government due to the pandemic have all been spent on one-time uh, payments. Uh, we have been living within our means this past budget. It was, I think it was a, a good budget, a fair budget, um, and a fiscally responsible budget. We, uh, we also added, um, we started a rainy day fund, which we have not had since Rauner was in office. So I'm pleased that we were able to do that. And we really allocated our funding to, uh, to, to the needs that we have in education, in healthcare, in public safety. That was where we spent our dollars. Thank you. The next question is this. Do you agree with current Illinois law regarding women's reproductive health services, including abortion? Candidate Gable. Uh, yes, I do. I, um, I, I, was, uh, I worked very hard on the laws that we passed most recently. Um, my whole career has been focused on protecting and expanding reproductive rights. Um, I, I actually, I, I ran a right of conscience act where it, we required that um, for those organizations that did not want to perform certain services that they at least gave people the uh, information about where they could get those services. It was an important first bill um, that, we, that, we, uh, that we passed. Um, I think that, uh, that Illinois has excellent laws around reproductive rights. I think we're now looking at ways that we can protect providers here from being um, uh, assaulted or you know, having, uh, uh, being sued by other states. So um, I, yes, I'm fully supportive of uh, the reproductive rights uh, laws that we have here in Illinois. Um, they really help women. They trust women. Women can make their own decisions about their reproductive health. Candidate Hutchinson, your answer to the question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Abortion is a big issue. Um, right now, I believe that uh, Illinois law is actually a little bit out of touch from what most people want. Uh, right now, it is unfettered up to the moments during birth. A woman can ask for abortion for any reason whatsoever. Um, and that's not what most people want. Uh, I, I personally support, you know, a ban on abortion when it comes to the last trimester, speaking to many doctors and OBGYN, you know, if there is an issue with the health of the mother or the child, their best course of action is to birth the baby and work to save, to save both mother and child. And I support that. I don't think there's a reason to have an abortion during the last trimester, especially for any reason whatsoever. And also, I do not support the current law that says a 15 and 16 year old girl can go and have an abortion behind their parents' backs. I think that family involvement and support system is very important when a young girl has to have an abortion. And I think that parental involvement is necessary for all uh, children's you know, medical needs and healthcare needs. And to sit there and say, to pass a law saying that a child, a 15, 16 year old girl should have an abortion behind her parents' backs I believe is, is unconscionable and lacks common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Hutchinson, what steps, if any, should be taken to prevent violence, including gun violence in our communities? That's a great question because that is something that is happening a lot. It is growing and it is, you know, it used to be that we used to keep it in pockets in the city. It was kind of kind of kept in there, but we see that it is creeping up into Evanston and Wilmette. We've had an armed robbery in Wilmette. We had a man who was dragged out of his car and, and the car was stolen. We've had six homicides from gun in Evanston, which is double the average of the last five years and six times what it was last year. So yes, violence is a big issue. The Safety Act is not helping. 
the Safety Act needs to be repealed. It will not help. It will make neighborhoods less safe. As I've said before in this forum, people want to live in safe neighborhoods. And it's the state to provide that. We need to give the police the resources to be able to stop violent crime and to be able to fully pursue criminals and criminal activity. The Safety Act takes away many of those uh, abilities of police, take, takes away many of those resources, and it, it doesn't help keep our neighborhoods safe. So I believe that given the police, they're our front line, they're our best, uh, our best defense against criminal activity, giving them the ability to do what they do, and that is keep our neighborhoods safe, is the best way to go. Thank you. Candidate Giva, what steps, if any, should be taken to prevent violence, including gun violence, in our communities? Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I already spoke to the piece about gun violence, but let me uh, speak a little bit about a, a three-pronged approach that I think is important to uh, reduce crime and increase public safety. First, uh, I would say that uh, the first important speak is a part is a, a bill a funding package that I voted for that includes uh, in prevention that includes mental health services. Proven community-based services will be funded to work with youth to prevent services, to prevent violence. There actually is a whole package that we have to work with youth in communities um, to prevent violence and to address primary needs. Secondly, um, I voted to provide police with high-tech tools they need to solve crimes, such as crimes in carjacking, car, uh, highway shootings, and attacks on individuals. Um, there are, uh, uh, with cameras and other items, we actually put quite a bit of money into, into solving crimes. What we found is that only 10% of all the crimes are solved. Um, and thirdly, I voted to crack down on illegal guns in the state. Um, I think that the Safety Act, which was mentioned, really is um, a way to protect us more. It will actually keep violent criminals out uh, in jail instead of being able to bail out. And I think that's really important to understand. Um, right now, there can people, anybody can bail out, even violent uh, offenders. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a quick follow-up, um, beginning with candidate Gable, um, do you support an automatic weapons ban? I do. Candidate Hutchinson? For automatic weapons? Uh, yes, there, I believe there already is a ban on automatic weapons. Yes, I support that. Thank you. Just to give you an opportunity to um, share your thoughts more about the um, Safety Act, um, Candidate Hutchinson, we'll begin with you. Do you think the Safety Act represents positive reform in criminal justice? And if so, why? If no, Please give your specific objections to the act. Sure, yes, thank you for the question. I do not support the Safety Act. I believe it will make neighborhoods less safe. We're seeing that already. You couple that along with people like Kim Fox and other attorneys, uh, you know, uh, state attorneys, and it's, it's gonna be a disaster. We already have 50 counties suing to stop uh, the Safety Act from fully implementing. That's, you know, Democrats and Republicans. It's not, it's not a partisan issue. It's a bad bill. It's simply bad. It literally, if you read it, it eliminates the term bail, cash bail, bond from the law. So in other words, you're you're going to either be on electronic monitoring, you're going to be out, or or you know you have to be a very severe crime uh, to stay in jail. Most drug crimes are going to be just simply given a ticket, told to show up uh, to court, and and released back into the community. And people don't want to live in communities where there's people selling drugs on the street corners. People don't want to live in neighborhoods that are full of crime. Um, again, it does, if you read the bill, homicide is one of those one of those uh, uh, situations where you may not be necessarily kept in jail. Uh, kidnapping is another one, arson's another one. So it, it, it does not help keep our neighborhoods safe. And that's, that's the whole goal of the justice system is to keep people safe. Thank you. Candidate Gable, the same question. Do you think the Safety Act represents positive reform for criminal justice? And if so, why? If no, please give your specific objections to the act. So let's be clear first that the Safety Act has not even uh, uh, come in, it's not even started yet. And so to say that uh, um, there are we can already see how much harm it's caused is, is blatantly ridiculous. 
But in response to the murder of uh, George Floyd, the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus crafted the Safety Act to reform the cr cr uh, criminal justice system, systemic racism. The law addresses uh, many things, the use of force, body cameras, pretrial detention, among other issues. I, I do support this. I do believe it will create more fairness in the criminal justice system and help us be smart on crime, just make stuff making our communities safer. Um, it's also, as I've mentioned, critical that the police are given the funds to purchase equipment that will help them solve the crimes. The bail reform efforts in the bill gives judges more power to hold dangerous offenders in jail because they will be making decisions based on a public safety assessment. Are they a threat to themselves? Are they a threat to others? Or are they a flight risk? Rather than just, can they pay, their, pay the bail? I have to tell you, domestic violence groups and victims, uh, crime survivor advocates support this approach. They were at the table when this bill was written. Um, uh, you know, right now, people accused of murder, abuse, and other violent crimes can get out of jail by just having the money to bail out. There are more than- Thank you. Thank you. Um, shifting topics just a little bit. Um, well, a lot, I guess. Um, and we have the next question. We'll begin with candidate Gable. What are your thoughts on other states' governors sending immigrants, mig sending migrants to Illinois? What responsibility does Illinois have for the migrants? So I think it was quite unusual for us to see the other, other governors sending immigrants to Illinois. But Illinois has always been a welcoming state. We know that our strength is, is in, our, in, our, uh, in our differences. And we know that we have had immigrants coming to the state and growing the state for many, many years. Uh, including people, immigrants coming to the city of Chicago, but also immigrants going to Southern Illinois and helping with our farmers. So this is, um, this is something that I think we have um, taken, uh, uh, taken in and we, have, we are providing um, places for the new immigrants that have come here. Many of them are fleeing violent uh, governments and they are coming here for safety. I know that in Chicago, we are helping people who have come here as immigrants to, to make a new life. We're helping them find housing. Um, we're helping them with uh, health care. Um, I think that uh, it's ridiculous that they're sending people here, but uh, you know, in Illinois, we are, we are going to be taking care of people because we know that they bring um, uh, innovation, and excitement to our to our workforce, and uh, we know we need more workers here too. Thank you, okay. Candidate Hutchinson. What are your thoughts on other states' governors sending migrants to Illinois? What responsibility does Illinois have for the migrants? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, just want to say that I think we all all support migrant workers. All support you know people coming into our country and helping with the workforce. We just want them to do it the right way. We want them to come in through the front door and let us know who they are and, you know, declare themselves. You know, what we have is governors sending illegal aliens who have broken our laws and are overwhelming their states to states like Illinois, which is a sanctuary state. Why would you be surprised that they would send us here? We basically told them, please come. We're not going to, we're not going to report you to the FBI or anywhere else. So we're not going to cooperate with Homeland Security when it comes to to uh, people breaking the law. So I wouldn't be, I'm not surprised they're doing it. Uh, but do we have a responsibility? Yes, we, we do. But we should also have a responsibility to our citizens. You know, when, when, when we have more and more illegal aliens coming into the country and coming into Illinois, and we see violence going up many times uh, by people who are illegal aliens, that's a problem. And we need to protect our citizens. We need to protect our workers. Um, and, you know, migrants, absolutely, you know, uh, people coming in, they're just coming the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Our time is coming to a close. So I do want to ask this one last question. Um, and we'll start with candidate Hutchinson. Do you agree with House Bill 1, which would amend the Illinois Constitution to guarantee the right of workers to unionize and collectively bargain? 
Great question. I know that's been a hot topic right now. Amendment one is a big one. Um, you know, right now it only really deals with um, public sector unions. Uh, you know, federal federal law covers private union uh, uh, organization, so it, it wouldn't affect the uh, the the, uh, the the public sector or the private sector right now. You know, I do know teachers. I have teachers in my family. And I have a lot of friends who are teachers, many of which have left the union uh, because they don't find that it, it does much for them. Um, this would force them to rejoin the union, which they don't want. I think it's imperative that workers and employees be able to join a union or not, if that's what they want to do. Uh, it also allows unions to override law that, that we pass by the legislature. And, so you can't, and the legislature would not be allowed to pass laws that might infringe on the union wants, which I think is wrong, because we, as a legislature, represent the people, and we represent what the people want. So we should be able to pass laws based on that, not based on what the union leadership wants. So I do not support Amendment 1. I don't think it's the right thing. We are already a very pro-union state, and that's fine. It's great that we're pro-union. But at the same time, you know, there needs to be a balance between the legislature and the union. Thank you. Candidate Gable, your thoughts. Well, thank you. Um, so I do support uh, the workers' rights amendment. I think that we've seen workers' rights being eroded in many parts of the country. And I think we want to assure that the workers in this state have the right to organize and bargain collectively for the purpose of negotiating wages, hours, and working conditions. I think that, you know, many people, uh, well, I, I think that the way that our economy grows is by having workers who get paid enough money to buy products. I'll tell you when I went around to businesses and I would say, what can I do for you as a legislator? What can I do for you? And they said, you can get me some customers. So I think the way that you get customers is by paying people a fair wage so that they can um, contribute to society and, and be able to buy the goods that we are producing. So yes, I do support uh, uh, the uh, Constitutional Amendment 1. Thank you. Well, it's time for closing statements. You will each have one and a half minutes to, to make a closing statement. And we'll begin with candidate Gable. Okay, thank you. So uh, I would again like to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this forum. I appreciate it. I think it's been informative and educational. I also want to thank constituents who are will be watching this later. I uh, really appreciate the fact that you're civically engaged, and um, I, I uh, look forward to working with you. Um, so uh, over over my tenure in the legislature, I have listened to people from every part of the district. The 18th district has some of the most progressive policy advocates and some of the most wealthy conservative interests in the entire state. I have balanced these interests well. Every year, passing bills brought to me by my constituents, whether they be about railroad safety, physician disciplinary boards, or protecting bees and butterflies. As an assistant uh, majority leader for the past two years and a member of Speaker Welch's leadership team, I can have more influence on policy and legislation. This gives me the opportunity to bring the voices of the 18th district to the Capitol. No matter how you feel after this debate, please remember to vote and encourage all those around you to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Candidate Hutchinson, you have the one and a half minutes for a closing statement. Thank you very much. And I wanna again, thank the League of Women Voters for putting on this forum and thank the Wilmette Public Library and also thank our incumbent candidate. You know, right now, Illinois is number one. We are number one in property taxes, number one in gas taxes, number one in overall taxes. We are number one in violence. We are number one in businesses who either are leaving the state or are wishing to leave the state. And we're number one in people leaving the state. So my question to everybody out there is, how is being number one working out for you? If you were like me, Charles Hutchinson, into the 18th district to represent you, that's our first step into being number one in a whole bunch of different categories. Number one in education. Number one in the value you get for the tax dollars that you send to Springfield. Number one in economic opportunity. Number one in the places where business want to come and expand and grow. And number one in a place to raise a family. 
So I want to thank everybody for watching. God bless you. God bless the state of Illinois. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you both for be taking time this afternoon to be with us. And I also want to thank the uh, Wilmette Public Library for providing their expertise to support this important voter education event. And to all who will watch this, thank you. Our democracy thrives when all of us are engaged. Attending or watching a candidate forum is a great way for you to empower yourself to make an important decision on election day. We hope you will all vote and encourage your family, friends, and neighbors to do the same so that all will express their preference by voting for the candidates of their choice on November 8th. So thank you once again and have a great day. Bye. Thank you.